stage. Everybody, is it on? <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I'll wait till the presentation starts. I guess we'll just hang on for a minute, but I'll, I'll start talking a little bit before that. Um, my name is Erin Walker. Um, I am from Pleasanton. I'm currently still residing in Pleasanton, and I am a licensed professional counselor. Um, I will go ahead and go a little bit into about myself so that y'all have some knowledge on my background. I got my bachelor's in psychology from Texas A&M University and College Station. <laughs> Best time of my life. Um, and then I transitioned to St. Mary's University in San Antonio and I got my master's in clinical and mental health counseling. I did two years internship at the Bear County Juvenile Detention Center where I worked with recently detained youth and did basically mental status exams on suicidality, substance abuse, kind of all day long. I would see almost 30 children a day or youth. Um, and so coming in and in all different walks of life. So it was a very eye-opening um, internship for me. Um, I loved it. I didn't really expect myself to come back um, to open a private practice, but that's just where the Lord has has lent my life, and I came back here. I did, you have to get 3,000 hours after you get your full degree to even be a counselor. So I worked in private practice, and it took me two and a half years to even get uh, my full license. So that's just kind of the journey to get it in general. Then I decided to open my own private practice. I felt like this community really needed more mental health resources. So um, I've been doing that since 2018. Um, a little bit of why I do what I do. I have always struggled with anxiety myself. Um, I was formally diagnosed when I was 18 that I had generalized anxiety disorder. And um, which to me was extremely validating because I knew it was something I wrestled with, but I didn't understand what it was. Um, I remember being eight years old and having what I would say a, a kind of a little mini panic attacks with my mom, asking really big questions about what happens after we die and what do you mean the world just keeps going? And you know, it was just things and I couldn't calm myself down and, and the worries were just so big that you know, it was concerning to my mom. Sorry. So when I say I got in this profession, I come with it in, with such empathy because I know what it looks like and what it feels like to live in those trenches of mental health, and I have such a passion for it. So I am going to give you guys some, some basic information really quick because it's important to understand the knowledge of it. Um, so. The formal, I guess, definition of mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, and can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. I know that's kind of a broad um, definition, but it's important to understand, be able to cope with the normal stresses in life. If it's hindering you from being able to socialize, go to work, get out of bed, different aspects like that, there's probably something that's not well. So mental wellness in general, nobody experiences perfect mental health or well-being all of the time. Obviously, we know that. 
Um, we have to learn how to balance that different aspects in our life, and then when things change, we have to reestablish that balance. And I'm sure from your own experiences, it has affected different aspects of your life, so work or relationships or sleep or eating, you name it. And there's such talk about we need to take care of our physical bodies, our physical bodies, but our mental health is just as important and affects everything. We are holistic creatures. We have to take care of every different aspect. So what is being mentally well about? It's being mindful of the choices we make and the boundaries we set for each aspect in our life. Being intentional of the decisions we make for our mental, emotional, physical, relational, spiritual needs and what culti- it's, is what cultivates a more balanced life. And the other thing is we need to make note when we start seeing ourselves decline because it is our own responsibility to hold ourselves accountable when things aren't going well. So something else I'm going to touch on is why do we push away negative emotion? And the biggest thing is we are so taught to not feel because it's too much or it's too bad. We just need to be okay. Um, We're fine. Or it's hard for us to let others in because it's too scary for them to see us for who we are and our our flaws or or whatever we lies that we do tell ourselves or Satan tells us. Um, we go through life that we just need to get over it. Um, everybody else is going through things, mine's not that big, and it should just be okay. And that, in turn, invalidates our emotions. It invalidates our experiences. Our feelings are here for a reason, and it's our responsibility to listen to them and validate our own experiences Something that Audrey spoke about last night that really resonated with me beyond the fact that it was just so remarkable that you shared was she was experiencing tremendous pain through her grief, but she kept showing up for her emotion, grieved it, prayed through it, and moved forward. She didn't push it away because it was too much. She showed up. She had the courage to feel that, even though it was tremendous, and that was what you know, led to her healing. Healing doesn't come from pushing things away. Healing comes from showing up and feeling it and grieving it, praying through it and moving forward. So what do we do when we start to notice that things aren't going maybe down the right path? I, I put in a few questions up here that you could be a great start to just ask yourself. I don't know how often we really check in to say, how are we doing? Uh, We check in on others for sure. How are you? Are you doing okay? So some of the things are as simple as, have I been eating meals regularly? Have I allowed myself to be poured into spiritually? Have I gotten fresh air? Have I been getting enough sleep? Have I allowed myself to be consumed by the news? Have I been giving myself social media comparison? Have I made time to connect with loved ones? These are just some basic ones that I use that I felt like would be helpful for you guys. So along those lines too is taking care of your mental health. I kind of just made this up myself, but I call it the daily battle plan. Um, I'm fully aware of my anxiety and if I continually and consistently show up and take care of myself, I know on the really bad days that it's going to make a difference. So I have my own little plan that I keep with me and I just consistently stick to it. And obviously I have a lot of grace for myself when things don't go the way that I always want them to. But I just put a few simple self-care routines up here. Um, Creating a routine of starting each morning and ending each evening with a prayerful meditation. That's key. Um, Taking a social media sabbatical. Obviously, it's not been very beneficial for us lately. (laughs) Uh, Making time for joy. Yes, we are allowed to experience joy and make time for that in our lives. We don't have to be these martyrs that everybody else has to be okay for me to be okay. No, you can't take care of others if you're not okay. Make time, um, finish a book or Bible plan. 
I've heard a lot of New Year's resolutions being that people want to read books more and be off media, which I love. Uh, making intentional time to call friends or family. That's more important now than ever with isolation and the pandemic. Maintain a full sleep schedule. Um, sleep schedule twice on there. <laughs> and then make time for 30 minutes of physical activity. That is something very important to me. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Got me every morning. I'm at the gym to just do my, do my thing because that's me time. I channel my stress. I deal with it. So for me, that's important, but it can look very different for each of you. There's not a, you have to do this for it to make sense. All right, I am gonna move to just some statistics of mental health. I know it's kind of, you know, they can be kind of not relatable, but it's really important for y'all to understand how real this is. And it's even more real, the fact that we've been going through so much lately. One in five US adults experience mental health, mental illness each year. One in 20 U.S. adults experience serious mental illness each year. One in six U.S. youth aged six through 17 experience a mental health disorder each year. 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins at age 14 and 75% and at age 24. And then lastly is suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 through 34. So, um, brings me to tears thinking about that. Um, it's real. It's something that we need to pay attention to. It's something that we need to talk to others about and we need to love another, okay? Um, on the next slide, it is more, this is kind of the clinical aspect of it. I just felt like it was important for you guys to see some of the signs and symptoms. I put adults, and then I also put in adolescents and young adults, and I also put younger children and pre-adolescents, so that you understand what to look for in your own children or your friends' children. So some of the biggest ones that I feel are notable, um, social withdrawal. Um, dramatic changes in eating or sleeping. Uh, anger is a really missed, understood symptom because we assume oh, they're just frustrated or moody and I don't know what to deal with them. When I experienced anxiety, it came out in irritability 100%. And my mom and dad were, where's my little girl? Like, why is she so angry? She's I don't understand. This isn't someone that I, I can recognize. And I hated that I, act, I, I hated that I felt that way and was acting that way, so which further shamed why I was going through that. So pay attention to the anger and figure out what's going on, because that's probably the most pronounced symptom. Um, and the same thing, uh, if you guys need a copy of this or want this, please come, you know, if you need it, I will happily share, okay? Um, and I know that with all the changes with online school and all that, it's really hard to, you know, see the kids and get a true reflection on how they're coping because it's all different. Um, on the next slide, just something for you girls uh, that I really want to resonate with y'all is that we're all worthy of love and support and what we need for people that feel shame in their mental health struggle is we need empathy, we need understanding, we need humility, we need active listening and a discernment for timing. What we don't need is gossip about the condition, judgment, quick assumptions, or more shame. There's already such an isolating factor to mental health that Nobody will understand. Nobody can possibly understand why would I share that. They're just going to quickly dismiss me. Um, have you guys ever been through something where you finally opened up and shared with someone and they just kind of dismissed it all together? Maybe because they didn't understand, but it felt like someone just stabbed you in the gut. That could be a factor for someone really wanting to hurt themselves or not. I'm not trying to be blunt, but that is the truth. 
So keep that in mind. You might not understand, but you can show love, okay? Two more things and I'll wrap up. I know I have a, I'm on my time limit here. Um, reasons we don't reach out for support when we should anyway, similar to what I just discussed, is we don't see it as our, we see it as our problem and we don't want to burden anyone else. I hear that so much. It's even challenging for women to, or anyone to open up to me in the counseling office because they're like, there's no way that you've been through this. There's no way you understand. Or this is my issue. There's no way you can possibly help me. Um, it says we know what we need to do, but we don't have the motivation to do it. Um, there's a chance that they won't help um, the way that we want to do it, or we would do it. We don't want anyone to witness our flaws, and we think it will dis disqualify us. Um, it takes so much courage to show up for this. It takes so much courage to show up to a counselor's office or to a friend and say, I need help. So if someone is saying that to you, show up for them. Even if you don't understand and you're worried about saying the wrong thing, get them to the place that they can. You don't have to be all of those things for people, but just show up when they show up with you. And lastly, um, this is just a little thing I found. This is a, a prayer for my mental health. Um, guys, I really believe in the power of prayer. I really do. I've seen the Lord really show up for people on my, you know, that are in the office or going through the counseling process in ways that I have just been floored by. Um, but we have to show up. We have to be responsible for our own emotions. We have to try to work through them. They can't, you know, Jesus is with you. He will be beside you the whole way, but you have to take those steps. This isn't something that I'm going to pray through it and it's going to miraculously disappear. And if that's worked for you, that's amazing. But I know that's not what necessarily probably a God intends, uh, but he's never forsaken anybody that, you know, that I've seen. So um, this says, Lord, you know the intricacies of my heart and mind better than anyone else. Show me the roots of my thoughts so I can begin to heal, give me strength to do the work, and the wisdom and humility to know when to reach out for help. So I hope that this was an encouragement to you guys. I will be here the rest of the day, and I want, if you have any questions about what are the differences between counselors and psychiatrists, or how do I even make those first steps, or any of those things, I am here. Um, I just want to be an, a beacon of light for you because I know it can be dark. So know that you're loved, and thank you so much.